Good day to our viewers from around the world. My name is Les Carlisle, and I'm the Group Conservation Manager at and Beyond, and your host today to celebrate World Pangolin Day on the 20th of February. Today is the second event, second live event that we're broadcasting about these mysterious and oddly charismatic animals. Our first event was hosted by Clara Glaseska, the executive travel editor from Town and Country magazine in New York a week ago, and featured arguably the most eminent pangolin experts in the world. We talked about the plight of the pangolin worldwide in this event, and it was broadcast on Facebook and YouTube, and you're welcome to go across and have a look to catch up. Key takeouts from this event for me were that there's a total lack of awareness globally about the pangolin. People just don't even know that the animal exists. People also don't know the scale of the trafficking worldwide that's happening with the pangolin. The pangolin is the most trafficked animal in the world at the moment. People also don't know that it's highly endangered. Um, one of the remarkable things about endangered species is that we only get to know how endangered they are once we start picking them up in all of the law enforcement around the world. And to help our viewers understand what we're talking about, we need to look at this graph that was presented um, by the United Nations on the trafficking of pangolins. And it's quite remarkable that between 20, 2007 and 2018, there's been a dramatic increase in the pangolin that have been seized um, by the law enforcement agencies, trafficked pangolins. Look at that number of 140,000 pangolins trafficked in one year. That's 380 pangolins a day, or 15 pangolins every hour. Absolutely remarkable that these poor creatures are in this unbelievable state. Um, one of the reasons why we've got this panel together is to try and make sure that we can understand what's happening with the pangolins. And two other takeouts that we've had uh, from last week was that we need more protected areas for these pangolins. They're an incredible species, but they need space. And of course, the mistaken thinking that small animals like pangolins aren't critical to biodiversity. Biodiversity, which is essential for our continued existence as a human race on this planet. So back to the positive story to start with why we're all here today. A bit of background about me. I've been with and Beyond since it was incorporated 30 years ago. And in those 30 years, we've been working tirelessly to leave our world in a better place, using the and Beyond mantra of care of the land, care of the wildlife, and most importantly, care of the people. And Beyond in those early days was called Conservation Corporation Africa. And we had an ambitious project that was started at and Beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve in the early 1990s, which was effectively rehabilitating agricultural land and trying to develop a game reserve on cattle farming, livestock, and agricultural land. This involved the reintroduction of many of the large mammal species that originally inhabited the region. These reintroductions included all the big game like elephant and lion and cheetah and buffalo and many, many more. The Timex ground pangolin used to occur naturally across this area, but had been locally extinct for decades. So we're really thrilled now to be collaborating with the pangolin reintroduction project led by the African Pangolin Working Group and the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital to help find new homes and protected reserves like Pinda for pangolins seized in the illegal wildlife trade. Sounds quite simple. Confiscate, translocate, release. I mean, how difficult can that be? To find out, we're going to interrogate this panel we've assembled today, and we'll give you a small glimpse behind the scenes at what's involved in a pangolin reintroduction project by following the journey of a pangolin from the moment that it's reclaimed from the illegal wildlife trade, stabilized and rehabilitated at the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital, and then translocated to reserves like Pinda Private Game Reserve and Manyoni in Zululand for release and monitoring. I'm sure many of you will have questions and comments as you listen today. You can comment on your live stream of this conversation, both on Facebook and YouTube, and there will be a Q&A session at the end for more discussion. For our viewers, please note that where our experts are pictured handling pangolins, this is done where it's part of a strict rehabilitation and monitoring process and is undertaken in the most sensitive manner possible. 
So without further ado, we're going to go across to our first panelist, Professor Raymond Janssen. Prof. Janssen is quite remarkable in that... Hi, Ray. Hello, Liz. Uh, hello, everybody. Let me just introduce Ray to you. Prof. Raymond Janssen is the professor in the Department of Environmental Water and Earth Science at Tswane University of Technology in South Africa. He graduated from Percy Fitzpatrick Institute at UCT with a PhD in zoology in 2000 and has published widely on the natural history, indigenous plants and animals in South Africa. Prof. Janssen has been studying African pangolins since 2009 and in 2011 founded the African Pangolin Working Group, NGO. Ray is the chairman of the African Pangolin Working Group and it's 10 years, Ray, since you first started yeah. that. <laughs> Wonderful. Ray also holds a position on the IUCN Species Survival Commission Pangolus Specialist Group, and he's directly involved in stemming the illegal trade in pangolins through his work with the African Pangolin Working Group. So Ray, if you don't mind, I'll jump in with the first question. Where do the project pangolins come from? Um, well, it's a good question because we don't really know. The pangolins don't want to tell us, and um, the poachers we catch don't want to tell us either. <laughs> but, um, you know, if we look at the nationality of um, a large number of, of the guys that we arrest, um, it's well over 60%, 70% are Zimbabwean nationals. Um, the remainder are made up of um, uh, our bordering countries, Mozambique, Botswana, and sometimes Namibia. And then um, South African middlemen. I don't believe a large number of the pangolins we retrieve out of the trade are actually poached within South Africa. I think it's probably a, between 10 and 20 percent. Um, when we did genetic studies with our neighboring countries and as far afield as Zambia and Malawi, there's no molecular difference in the Temex pangolin. So it's very difficult to determine origins. Um, but if we look at these chaps we catch, they largely migrant labor. Uh, that bring pangolins with them. And if we look at the economies of our neighboring countries, with the exception of Botswana and Namibia, but certainly Zimbabwe and Mozambique economies are pretty much crashed, most certainly in Zimbabwe. Uh, work is difficult to find. Um, livelihoods are difficult to maintain for families. And, um, you know, often they revert to crime and uh, wildlife trafficking is also part of that crime and forms a large proportion of that crime. And it's a quick uh, get-rich scheme, I would think, in many of these instances. It is strange, though, that um, these animals are perceived to be worth so much money. But I think with modern technology and social media, um, pang the, the world is experiencing a little bit of a pang wave. And I think this also contributes uh, towards um, marketing these poor creatures. And as we know, they were um, voted internationally and unconditionally by all countries, uh, CITES Appendix 1 in, um, that came into effect in January 2017, which effectively means you may not commercially sell or buy any of the eight species of pangolins. So any of the movement of pangolins, if it's not for science or for some sort of research or permitted um, through CITES, it's illegal and it's underground. And uh, we see a large proportion of it in recent years becoming organized crime. In this country, there's a special branch of police called the DPCI, the Directorate of Priority Crimes Investigation Unit, and they, their mandate is organized crime only. And now they've been mandated to um, incorporate and include pangolin trafficking. So it just shows you how serious it's getting um, that the prices for these poor creatures have ridden, risen so exponentially. They're now not sold per kilogram, they're sold per gram, much like rhino horn. Um, as they become rarer, as they become more illegal, so to speak, as it goes deeper underground, the prices escalate, and so more people be, uh, come, in, come involved, very similar to Rhino. That's amazing. Um, and Ray, so with a crime situation like this, how do you actually get your hands on these guys? What's the intervention that you use to make the arrest? It it, um, it was quite a learned process, and Les, I didn't really ask for it. It kind of landed on my lap, you know. Um, it, the first thing you've got to be a damn good liar, and um, you you know you you've got to convince these guys you're their buddy and you're interested, and but you've also got to be very careful. Um, an entrapment procedure is an illegal procedure, so 
Uh, I work very closely with the police units in South Africa, uh, various different units, the crime intelligence units, canine units, as I mentioned, the DPCI, as well as the Stop Theft Endangered Species Unit, um, the government uh, Green Scorpions, also known as the Environmental Management Inspectorate, Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, National Prosecuting Authority. So it's a, it's a very um, diverse um, but legal government structured group um, I'm the only non-cop on the groups, <laughs> uh, but but I'm the guy who does the lying. So what essentially happens is a member of public is approached by somebody with a picture of a pangolin or a video of a pangolin or something on his phone or via social media. Often the member of public doesn't know what to do. It is then transferred to a police station somewhere in the country. It's then transferred to either the DPCR, also known as the Hawks, or it's transferred to the Stop Theft Endangered Species Unit. And then um, inevitably many times it's transferred to me to start my lying process. And um, we then apply for what's called a 252A, which is a procedure that is legally entitled us to um, perform this operation. Otherwise it is entrapment. So that's when the chain of custody starts. Then you start talking to this, these chaps. Um, there's normally four to five involved, uh, sometimes more, because each one wants a slice of the cake. Inevitably, the middleman is a South African chap who wants a slice of the cake. Um, and then they start wanting to know if we're interested and how much we want to buy the table for. And it's, it's exorbitant amounts of money. Uh, and so the negotiations start. I never agree on a price. My first objective is to make sure the animal is alive and it's well. And once I've seen it's alive and it's well, then I'll leave the animal with that person and I'll go off to the bank and I'll draw the money. But by the time I see it's alive and well, uh, my unit is in place, clothes, hidden all over the place, normally either in a parking lot of a mall or a, 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 a petrol garage, uh, something like that, hopefully not too many people around, um, because one in five operations normally ends up in a gunfight. Um, and then when I see it's, it's alive or it's a bat, I just notice it's a pangolin. I normally give a signal. And then, um, so to say, the poo hits the fan. And uh, that's, that's normally how it goes down. That's unbelievable, Ray. It's a, it's a complete clandestine military uh, police sting operation to be able to get your hands on these live pangolins. Yes. Um, I've got some, some images that um, will depict... Um, how we find them. Um, so the one you see on the screen now is is a, a minute or two after the operation has gone down. You'll notice that that vehicle's um, back boot is open and uh, you can see remnants of a box. Um, uh, that's where the pangolin is. So I got eyes on, I gave the signal and uh, these five uh, individual men were, were arrested. Uh, by a, a rapid response police task team. I've also got some more close-up images of um, uh, that. That's another one of a, of a separate operation. Um, it was also at a filling station. Uh, that's the undercover parking near the filling station. The box in the distance there uh, holds the pangolin. Um, I was able to just see through the side and, and pick up the scales of the animal. We have no idea what condition these animals are in at all. So um, the initial step is just to, to get a visual and give the signal. And here's another operation where the pangolin uh, is just thrown into a box. These, these pangolins are of incredibly powerful animals. They, they can break out of a box very, very quickly. So uh, this animal just indicates how absolutely exhausted it is. It's probably been in the trade for almost two weeks, uh, closer to 10 days. There's another image um, of, a, of one of the holding um, sacks and, and how we find these animals. We don't know if they're going to be tied up in wire. Uh, we, we retrieved one recently um, called Tom that was uh, um, caught in a snare. Uh, and the, he was in months at the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. I retrieved another one that was completely bound in a wire cage uh, where it couldn't move. It couldn't stretch its legs. It, it, it was covered in its own excrement for at least 10 days. Uh, so the, the, the primary focus of these operations is, is to institute 
uh, arrests of the perpetrators and then to get the animal to the hospital as fast as possible. Because, Les, they're all compromised. Um, mm. They're not only physically <clears throat> compromised um, with, with visible conditions such as, as external wounds. They've been hit with machetes. Some are even burnt with cigarettes. But um, they compromised in, in ways we can't see. A large number of them have um, respiratory disorders such as pneumonia. Um, they, they often infestated with external and endoparasites because their condition uh, has, has crashed so much that um, the parasite loads uh, just double up. Uh, but also they suffer um, from post-traumatic stress disorder. You can just imagine the psychological damage that's gone into these animals. Many of them are adults, so they've had territories and they've had home ranges, and they live these solitary lives that they come out at night and, and forage at peace in, in an environment that's very familiar to them. Um, the sounds of the bush and the nocturnal sounds of the night dogs and owls and you know lions and hyenas calling in the distance. Those of you who are familiar with the African bush at night will, will, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Then in a second, you picked up, thrown to a sack, bundled into a, a, a vehicle, often uh, you know a taxi. There's, there's loud music, um, there's cigarette smoke. Um, the large proportion of these chap are, chaps are men, um, and, and we see at the hospital that they don't even like the voices of, if they hear a man, they curl up into a ball. So there's absolute primordial fear goes into these poor animals. And um, later on in, in the discussion, you'll hear from, from Tolly uh, uh, at Andrea and Pindo, um, how the release process is so sensitive and so facilitated. But the first part of the journey is pulling them out of the illegal wildlife trade. Um, and we, we do it in South Africa. We, we, we assist in other parts of Africa, but obviously we can't get involved in, in law enforcement operations outside the borders of, of this country. Fantastic. And then, Ray, once you've got them, you mentioned you pass them on then for veterinary treatment. Who do you pass them on to? Okay, so the, the first port of call... Um, it's very important, Les, to keep a chain of custody because once you've arrested the perpetrators, their defense lawyer is going to try everything they possibly can to get them off. And one of the processes is if you break any part of that chain of custody. So um, when they're retrieved in the operation, they are booked into the nearest police station uh, and booked out of, the, uh, out of the police station as an exhibit with what's termed a SAPS 13 number, South African Police Service 13 number. And then um, I'm escorted uh, and I have permits to the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital where the pangolins are treated at an off-site facility to the hospital. But they are formally booked in by an, a government environmental management inspector into the hospital. So once they're in the hospital, um, they go under immediate ICU health care and a full checkup. And the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital is, is the only official veterinary hospital delegated to work with Temex Pangolins. The hospital does train other hospitals to do a similar function, but under their banner and under their guidance. So um, if the sting operation is a far afield, for example, in the Eastern Lowfelt uh, near the Kruger Park in the Hoodsprayt region, um, the, a pro-vet animal hospital under the guidance of Dr. Pete Rogers has been trained. Um, and then Pete also goes under the guidance, and uh, I, I forget the, I think it's Dr. Mike at Pinder, I'll ask Charlie, who's also undergone yeah. training, who, who who treats all the Pinder pangolins, and, and Charlie will tell you that e even a couple of months after release, if there's a cold spell or, or a spell that, that causes some induced stress or, or whatever, we find a lot of those pangolins um, that have hidden conditions such as pneumonia suddenly come to the fore and then they um, cassavac immediately out to Dr. Mike and, and uh, it's been a hell of a success story, I tell you. Uh, we've, we've, we've noticed um, weeks, months after release, some of these pangolins still suffering from, from conditions. So there are a, a few under the guidance of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. Um, and the process after the ICU or the hospital, it's then signed over to us once again. So there has to be this whole chain that we've got to prove in court because essentially we are custodians of a court exhibit. And in the old days, they simply used to 
pull the pangolin out the trade, drive to the nearest area that, that looks pretty. There's a nice baobab or a marula tree and let the animal go. The, the chances are about 99% those pangolins are no longer alive. Yeah. They were thrown into an environment and an habitat that they, they don't know. There may have been territorial pangolins. They've lost their own home ranges and territories. They undergo extreme stress once again of, of actually abandonment. It's, it's in, very yeah. interesting. And um, this facilitated approach has been extremely successful, um, it, it, most certainly in the last uh, five years. And we've learned a hell of a lot. And, and, and we're learning so much more every single day about these um, elusive, shy, charismatic, bewitching creatures that are, we're very privileged to work with. Fantastic, Ray. I mean, that, that's remarkable that you're dealing with state exhibits and then passing them on to the to the Johannesburg Veterinary Hospital. So we're very fortunate yeah. to have Mickey Wright with us. So thank you for your participation there, Ray. And uh, Mickey, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Les. Nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, and Nikki, just so that I can introduce you to our viewers, nikki has been a at the Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist for more than 20 years. And she's the founder and director of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital, which exclusively treats indigenous wildlife and most importantly, treats it all free of charge. So the veterinary hospital focuses on medium and small wildlife, filling a gap that many NPOs fund in conservation efforts are normally the large animals and the high profile animals, elephants, lions and rhinos and the like, but there are not many people focusing on the smaller animals and Nikki's Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital has that specific focus. Her expertise lies in rehabilitation, treatment, wildlife behavior, and then release techniques. Over the years, Nikki's managed to be part of several large rescues involving oiled water birds, poisonings, and even mass roost collapses. So Nikki's particular interest is in three specific smaller species, otters, honey badgers, and pangolins. She's a member of the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Otter Specialist Group, She's on the African Otter Advisory Group and the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Pangolin Specialist Group. Nikki's also the Wildlife Project Manager for the Humane Society, and she's the founding director of the African Pangolin <laughs> Working Group. So what an honor to have you here, Nikki. It just goes <laughs> on amazing. and on and on. <laughs> no, it's brilliant to have you here. Anyway, Thank um, you yeah, so much. Yes. <laughs> Thank we, you. We really appreciate your time. So. We've heard from Ray Pleasure. about the effort required to get the hands on this specific animal. Can yes. you tell us what sort of conditions he's alluded to a bit? What sort wow. of condition the penguins are in when they arrive with you? Yes. Um, well, I suppose it all depends, Les, on how long they've been in the trade for. Um, some of them have been tied up, as he said. Some of them have been tied into feed sacks and could have been in there for, for two weeks. Um, we've had uh, some that have, yeah, this little one in, the, in this photograph um, was sealed into the two halves of this yellow container, uh, wired into that, um, and in the container was sorghum beer. So she had been um, caught and then transported all the way from Mozambique through to Johannesburg in this condition. It was absolutely pitiful. Um, so, so they're in a variety of quite shocking states when they arrive. Uh, some of them have got wounds, um, infections, maggots, putsy fly, um, all sorts of things. So anyway, once they arrive at the hospital, um, we take them out of uh, their transport box and let them walk on the floor so that we can see if they're physically, um, how, they, how they are. You know, sometimes they can't walk. Sometimes mm. they've got a, a fractured leg or whatever it is. We then weigh them and take them into the theater where our two specialist vets um, anesthetize um, the animal so that we can unroll them. Because don't forget, even quite weak pangolins will roll into a ball and then you can't unroll them to put the, the anesthetic mask on them to in order to sedate them to start yeah. treatment. So um, we anesthetize them. Um, uh, have a quick look and put them onto a drip. And then um, the next the next Nikki, thing we do... Just, that sounds easy. How do you find a vein in amongst all those scales? <laughs> well, that was, that was, initially when we first started, that was one of the challenges. I mean, this animal has been very challenging because it, although it's a mammal, nothing is as it seems. So it's yeah. like a, it's a whole different ball game. 
um, from a behavior point of view and a, a veterinary point of view. And I'm so fortunate to have the vets and, and veterinary nurse that we do have um, on our team. Um, and we've learned so much. But where the vein is, it's a coccygeal vein. Um, so it's, it's uh, between the anus and the first scales on the underside of the, the tail. And it's a really nice, big, fat vein. So the vets tell me. And um, they never seem to miss it. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and that's where they put the drip in. But you can't okay. put tape and everything around. So, you know, like you would a normal, like on a dog's paw, for instance. So you have to hold that or put the, the gel coat in so that the drip is just running into that vein while the animal is anesthetized. And while this is going on, we're then having a look at the whole animal. They're taking um, its blood glucose and they're checking checking its blood in the blood machine to see all the different levels. And we're looking under every single scale to, to check for infection and to look for external parasites and that kind of thing. So um, once we've um, done all of that and we've run the bloods, uh, we put a microchip into the animal, uh, which is also part of that chain of custody um, evidence that, that Ray was talking about. Um, oftentimes the, um, the environmental uh, management investigator is there and he will see that a microchip going in and a photograph is taken of it. So he has that on record, the number he'll have on his transfer sheet as well. Um, and then once that has all been done and the animal has been stabilized, we'll, we'll um, tube feed it a liquid diet, which is a very nutritious, um, uh, it's like chicken soup for pangolins that yeah. we've made up that we found works for them. Because don't forget, they've been starving. They haven't had yeah. all the time that they've been in the poacher's hands. They haven't had food and they haven't had um, any water. So the dehydration levels are shocking and they're emaciated and starving. So they need to be slowly, slowly built up with a nutritious, easily digested um, diet. And that's what we do. Um, and then we, we let them wake up and we put them back into their into a sleeping box, which has been especially um, designed and um, manufactured for pangolins because it's, it's very strong and sturdy. Pangolins, as you know, are extremely strong and they can dig out of most things. Um, and then um, we actually just keep them in that situation for about three days. Every day they're, they're tube fed some more, um, uh, given fluids if they need, um, and, and just allowed to sleep and to rest. Because don't forget, these animals haven't been sleeping. So all the time that they've been in captivity, they, there's been no rest. And pangolins um, sleep, you know, they sleep during the day in their burrows. So they just afforded a time to just replenish themselves and, and take a bit of an in-breath. So that's the condition that we generally find them in. Um, and they go through that three days initial stabilization and, um, and treatment. Yeah. Okay, so the, the stabilization's done, the animal's in a better shape. You've, you've been able to see its um, nutrition has been sorted, its rest and sleep has been sorted. You've reduced the stress levels. What's the next level in the rehabilitation of these pangolins? Okay, so then usually on day four, we take them out walking. So we're very fortunate to have a fantastic piece of indigenous bush felt with a seemingly unending supply of ants and termites. I mean, we've That's walked wonderful. so many pangolins there and the ants just keep on coming. They keep on giving. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and a couple of different varieties of ants as well, because don't forget, um, my favorite saying is you can take a pangolin to ants, but you can't make it eat. And that's yeah. because they all have, they all have their, their personal preferences, which makes life very interesting because uh, we don't have all the species of ants that they mm. might have in Zimbabwe or Mozambique. So we have to find one that each pangolin uh, likes. So we assign a, an experienced walker with each pangolin. Some pangolins bond more with one walker than the other. It's very interesting, their personality mm. preferences. Sometimes they like me and not somebody else or, or vice versa. Um, and they feed better with their preferred person. It's, it's very interesting, their behavior. And they go out for walks and we, we weigh them beforehand and we weigh them after each walk to um, establish how many ants um, they're eating and that they are putting on weight and that it's optimum for their, for their growth. Um, this picture is um, on Pinda, interestingly enough, and this was a little pangolin whose rehabilitation process continued for a couple of months down at Pinda because he was still young but he needed to start settling in his, uh, in his environment. And I was just lifting him up here to um, an ant nest of uh, cocktail ants in this tree because he was too little to reach it. 
Um, but yeah, we, we basically become pangolin slaves and are available to fulfill their every whim. So if they need to eat ants up a tree, we lift them up the tree so that they can eat because it's all about them putting on weight and, um, and, and becoming, you know, better physically. Um, so while we're walking them, we, um, have little um, holes drilled into um, their scales on the side of them, uh, put a cable tie through that and attach these little uh, lights. They're, they're the lights that you can put onto your dog's collar if you walk them at night. Um, and so when it becomes dark, we can still see the pangolins because otherwise, as you know, they are disappearing um, experts and they can just simply disappear. It's, it's quite incredible. You can have a pangolin a meter away from you and not see it at all because it's just underneath the grass. Um, so, yeah, once they've, once they've uh, started to replenish themselves, uh, their behavior is normalized, their physical um, um, uh, discomfort from, from the poaching has, has normalized. They might have infections. They might have pneumonia. They could have all sorts of serious things. Some of them are with us for maybe three or four months before they're well enough. Um, the vets will then, um, and Dr. Corinne Lawrence is my business partner at the Joburg Wildlife Vet, and she's done her master's on normal blood values in Temex pangolin. So we know how to, we've got something that we can compare the abnormal yeah. values of these poached pangolins to. Um, and uh, she's, she's a, I would say that she's a leader in the veterinary treatment of Temex pangolin and probably pangolin worldwide because she advises people all over the world. So we're incredibly fortunate to have that expertise. So once the vets have given the pangolin the all clear um, and the behavior is normal um, and the pangolin is kind of ready to go, uh, we'll put it into the next phase, which is uh, going into the soft release situation. Okay. Do you want to talk us through um, once you're satisfied what that what that step is, what the soft release sure. is? Sure. So um, between the African Pangolin Working Group and the Department of Environment, Fishery and Forestry, I think it is DEF, um, and their scientific um, authority, we identify um, suitable pangolin release sites. So it would have to have particular type of fencing. Only you know they, we we can't have. Um, the tripwire of the electric fencing um, on because the pangolins will, will be electrocuted. So um, that has to be looked at. The, the size of the area of the release site has to be looked at. The, the habitat, the ant uh, um, species on the on the reserve, and then we also look at the ground team. So we need people to do all the post release monitoring, um, and we have to have you know a very dedicated team. To, to do that. And once all of that is in place and it's been approved by the department, we um, apply for the necessary permits to move the pangolin into another province. Um, and we, we go down and we spend time handing that pangolin over to the team on the ground because we know that pangolin so well. And so we help them assess um, the pangolin's behavior. And it's a stressful process for the pangolin. You know, people think for any wild animal, letting it go is wonderful. Yes, it is, but it's, it's also extremely stressful because they're going into a totally new situation, as Ray said earlier. Um, and the soft release process that we've designed um, is a gradual process that allows the, the animal to get used to that particular area that's been picked for it um, and get used to all the neighbors. I mean, they might not be used to elephant, for instance, or lion. So they've got to get used to all of those those things, meet the neighbors and find a, a, a burrow, find ants that they, that they like. Um, and we do this gradual um, soft release for up to five or six days, and then we let them go. Uh, but they're, they're very closely monitored, as you know, from um, – uh, you know, for the for the next three weeks, weighed every day because we need to make sure that they they're eating and they're feeding. And a weight drop is the first instance that we know that something is afoot, and that has saved. Just observing that has saved pangolins' lives um, in the release process. So um, that's why we need such dedicated uh, teams on the ground who are prepared to put in all those hours um, on the ground. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Part of the most amazing process for us has been um, the, the releasing of pangolins um, down at Pinda and, and basically into KwaZulu-Natal, where um, they have been um, environmentally or, or locally extinct for, I think it's probably about three decades. 
Um, mm. So this photograph is of Simon Naylor, the Conservation Reserve Reserve Manager of, of Pinda, releasing the very first pangolin um, into his soft release process. So the first two pangolins were a male and a female called Luna and Louie. And this is Simon releasing the first pangolin onto Pinda. And it's extremely apt because, um, of course, Pinda uh, in Zulu means the return. Um, and Pinda, I mean, under your guidance for all those years, has seen the return of, of many species, you know, elephant and rhino, cheetah, lion. I'm not sure if there are any others. And now, of course, the, the pangolin. And um, it's been it's been a wonderful journey with the Pinda team. They are incredibly dedicated, uh, so observant. And all the data, of course, that we, we gather from all of these re releases and all the release sites, uh, Pinda and Manyoni is another one in Zululand. Uh, we release pangolins up in Limpopo as well. Um, the data and the behavioral information from these animals has been absolutely incredible. We've learned so much about them and continue to learn. They are really mind-blowing, mind-blowing <laughs> animals. Um, so we've been so incredibly fortunate to work with good teams on the ground and, and the species. It's just incredible. Fantastic, Nikki. Thank you so mm. much for that incredible pleasure. insight into how you get these animals to the physical state where they are in a position to be able to be released. And yes. that brings and us to our, our next panelist as well, who's thank a you. member of, of your team. Um, so thank you very much, Nikki. It's a pleasure. Lena, Thank you, you, Les. <laughs> Hi, I'm very good, Les. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Um, Leno is um, a passionate Mexican conservationist who came to South Africa for the first time as a volunteer in 2011. And she started off working with the bigger animals like rhinos and, and then worked to, joined the African Pangolin Working Group as the Zululand Field Manager for this pangolin reintroduction program that we're discussing today. Leno has been part of the team that did the rehabilitation, that soft release, monitoring the first nine Temex ground pangolins that were reintroduced into Pinda um, after they had become locally extinct, as Nikki mentioned in, in the previous chat. So Leno has been working in the field every day, and she's been able to observe and register um, previously unrecorded behavior in these incredible animals. So Leno, what a pleasure to have you with us. Can you tell us uh, what your role is as the Zululand field manager for the African Pangolin Working Group. Sure, thank you so much for having me, Les. Um, yeah, well, my role is to pretty much coordinate everything what happens in the province. As Nikki mentioned just now, the, the release process that is going on in the province of Guazulu Natal is happening in two different reserves. Uh, the, we started at Pinda and months after we started in Manioni. And of course, uh, the Pinda, process was groundbreaking in every single way. So it was a little bit easier to move in, move it there to another reserve where I, where I moved in to try to settle the program there. Um, and yeah, well, coordinate that that all the reintroduction activities um, happen as a, as, a known, as a one team, you know, even if it's different reserves, different environments, different mm. processes and animals, uh, trying to, to coordinate and to understand these animals. I mean, pretty much uh, we think we're we're discovering things, but they are those are the ones that are teaching us so much. That's fantastic. I mean, it's incredible to see the future of uh, conservation. We've long held the view that it's about cooperation. We need to all work together to make conservation work. Exactly. And reserves next to each other have to work together because the biological processes don't respect the fences. Neither do the pangolins, as you've just explained. Exactly. So, so let me yeah, yeah and there's also no no really background on what we're doing now. So clearly we need to be communicating because whatever happens in one side, they may not know it in the other side. So it's very important that we are communicating all the time because everything is new to us. Everything what's happening is new to us. Oh, that's fantastic. So, so tell me, Lena, what do you look for in a release site or a reserve? How do you decide... Um, Nikki mentioned working to get the state permit, but what do you look for in a release site for a, for a pangolin? Well, that's pretty much a decision made by the African Pangolin Working Group itself, and not only me. But uh, the most important thing things will be the size, the amount of resources, that there's enough availability of food, and the, the correct species of ants and termites, even though the pangolins can eat a variety of them, 
Uh, some of them have different preferences than others, but making sure that the, the resources are enough. Also borrowing probabilities or, or rocky areas where they can shelter and and definitely the fencing, as Nikki mentioned as well, because the fences are, are a problem usually. If the trip wire is too low, uh, it's known that it's one of the main uh, problems that pangolins uh, face, uh, getting stuck on the trip wire, because uh, since they walk in two legs, uh, if the trip wire goes underneath the front legs, they will roll in a ball, and their belly, which is naked in the timing species, is going to be curled above the, the electric wire so they can get easily electrocuted. So the fencing is very important. And as Nikki mentioned, the the ground team, the, the infrastructure of, of people who's going to be working with the pangolins, because I think no one realizes, including me and pretty much everyone who's been involved in this program in Zulan, we have, no one has a clue on how much work uh, working with introducing pangolins is. It's just incredibly um uh, bc i mean it keeps you busy actually in that image i'm sitting in pinda next to ramphi ramphi was the first ever temmings ground pangolin who'd be raised by humans he was found when he was very very young uh, he was one kilo and a half when he was uh, found and then he was raised by humans i i was involved in the last part of his of that process until he reached six kilos and a half in order to be able to be released but of course, this process, as Nikki said, you can take them to the ants, but you cannot make them eat. So when we say that we we walk a pangolin, a lot of people imagine us with a leash or kind of guiding a pangolin where we want him to go. And, and no, it's the other way around. We put the pangolin in the ground and then we go wherever they want to go. They found their own food. They need to dig for it. They need to eat themselves. There's no other way to, to feed a pangolin in captivity if it's not tube fed or taking them for a walk as we said it's not clearly a walk but take them to feed on their own and you just need to be present and of course uh, in in the case of KwaZulu Natal both reserves that we are reintroducing pangolins are big five game reserves so you're walking for two three or four hours every day wherever the pangolin wants to go and and they love thickets they love drainage line and they, they love to take you to the most dangerous places so yeah it's quite tricky that's amazing. That's really incredible. So, you know, obviously there's variation in vegetation between the two reserves in this particular case, Pinda and, and Magnoni. Um, is there any behavioral change between the two reserves? Have you noticed that they behave differently in different habitats? Well, I think um, I remember my first days with pangolins and I remember Nikki telling me every pangolin is different. And I remember thinking a little bit like, meh. Every pangolin is so different. And, and some of them have preferences that we still don't understand. There's pangolins that for some reason, they go to rocky, rocky, unaccessible areas for us. For some reason, as, as Ray mentioned before, earlier as well, um, we don't know where they come from. So maybe that pangolin belongs to an area that was hilly and rocky, and he likes to shelter there in instead of a burrow. So in, in this case, is, uh, Pangolins are going to choose the area that suits them better, even if we choose a, a perfect area to do the soft release for them because it's safe for us, it's open, there's a lot of food. You may put it in the ground and that animal is going to move two kilometers straight to the drainage line that they were trying to avoid. But um, uh, between Pinda and Magnoni, even though they're very close and in the same area, the vegetation types and the ecosystems are very different. So um, even the species of ants and termites, because the the soil type is different as well so the type of term amounts are different so yeah i've seen i've seen different behavior and i think it's it's definitely according to the 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 amount of, of resources the type of soil because then uh, uh, there's more different type soil types in pinda and so i've seen pangolins needing to dig harder in different types of soil that you cannot see in Magnoni. And sometimes in Magnoni, there's so many ants in the surface, like ridiculous amount of food in some areas that they don't even need to dig. And, and also our work is a little bit different because Magnoni is way more hilly, way more hilly. So even the telemetry gets a little bit more complicated than in Pinda. I'm not saying it's easy in Pinda either. I've done it in both and <laughs> both are quite a mission, but it makes different different things. That's fantastic. And I think 
one of the one of the statements that you said quite glibly there was you move when the pangolins move and of course they move a lot at night so moving around at night in a big five game reserve is a real experience for anybody so especially a researcher from mexico so this is quite remarkable commitment that you've been showing to these pangolins so can you tell me what the long-term plan is for the zululand release node well, the long-term plan is it's clearly to create a sustainable population of Temex ground pangolin that can be safe. Uh, that's the main concern. Um, uh, between the animals that we have re released, um, we, we usually put two tracking devices on them. One that is a satellite tracking device and the other one that is telemetry to find them on the ground. Uh, but of course, as, as all of us have been saying, and you're going to hear Charlie as well, our next panel expert, um, we're learning, we're, we're still learning things. So the tracking devices at the beginning, we didn't know exactly if they were gonna work properly. And I'm not saying about the system or the the software itself, but, but hardware. So some of them fell down or broke a little bit. Pangolins are so strong. You cannot even imagine how strong they are and in the places that they can go into. So sometimes that tag can fell off. And of course you, you may lose that pangolin. And, and we have a few specimens that have been released that unfortunately lost both tracking devices. So those animals are hopefully doing good and, and, and free and no one's bothering them and, and not even us are going to check on them and to check their weight or their condition and they're absolutely free. And we all really think that they can make it also like underground, uh, under our watch, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So we, of course, monitor very closely the ones that, that we can, but there's a few others that have escaped the system. And, and maybe between two, those two teams, we're gonna be able to have a sustainable population. Because of course, also our monitoring, our close monitoring to keep them safe, to make sure they're doing good, that their condition is, is correct, that they're not losing weight, that the tick load is fine, that all of those little things also interfere with them. And sometimes we annoy them a little bit. And sometimes we need to, when we need to go check on a pangolin, you're gonna see that the next day, he's gonna move from his territory or he's gonna move in a direction that he's never been before or too many kilometers or things like that because we clearly interfere. So um, hopefully in the future, we can have released pangolins that we don't have to bother. That will be pretty much the point of having a healthy, sustainable population in the province. That's fantastic. And so, so now we've, we've alluded to it and I mentioned it earlier. What's been your most nerve wracking moment while you've been tracking <laughs> these things in a big five reserve? <laughs> we have so many. Every single one who has done it can tell you that. As you mentioned before, uh, pangolins are mainly nocturnal. So fortunately, the long process of soft, soft release of the young ones usually are still with a little bit of light. But monitoring the, the released pangolins is definitely in the dark. Um, so a lot of people ask me, like, if, if there's like a certification that you can have as you can have a trails guide or things like that, if there's a protocol to walk at night. And I always say that there is. And the protocol is you don't walk at night in a big <laughs> reserve. We shouldn't. So, of yeah. course, here I'm holding a telemetry. My head torch interferes with the telemetry, so I have to turn it off. And there's someone else with a with a head torch and the rifle and there's someone else for our safety clearly and there's another one with a spotlight but sometimes the areas that pangolins are are i promise you the thickest you've ever even during the day you wouldn't walk in there so my yeah. most nerve-wracking experience was um yeah you imagine that like pitch black in the dark <laughs> yeah. in a windy night so you cannot hear clearly what's going on around you it's terrifying i'm not gonna lie it's incredibly exciting it's fantastic, but sometimes it's terrifying. So my most nerve wracking experience would be when I was, we were trying to find Gomo, one of the big males that we have in Manioni, a beautiful old big male that I keep saying that is the most wise pangolin I've ever met. And, and it's hard to find that animal. Every time to we, we try to walk where he, to where he is and we know he's active, he gets into a burrow before we get there. So it's very hard to get him. We tried it for three nights in a row. This was the fourth night. It was FP and Nikki, uh, two incredible friends of mine and team members from Manioni, um, walking with me. Uh, FP was with the rifle in front of me, then it was me and then Nikki. And it was thick, very, very thick. We were close to the animal, I would say, according to the telemetry, maybe 50 meters away or so. 
but it was an area that we literally were moving branches to to go across the thicket and at some point uh we all decide like this is ridiculous like this is too risky guys we need to go back this is too thick if something pops up now like we're gonna get killed so we step back we went to another open area trying to get signal 90 degrees and go shorter uh, time through the thicket and we did that and at some moment the first thing i heard it was the two guys shouting because i was of course paying attention to the beep on the telemetry so i wasn't paying attention of the surroundings and they started shouting like hey 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 and i started shouting as well but you shout to a wall of thorns and leaves because your torch will only shine the first layer and there's you don't know what's behind that so we start hearing, hearing th that something, I keep saying that it was sounded like a train. Clearly it didn't sound like a train, but it was the branch breaking towards us, like cha -cha 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 -cha, getting closer, closer, closer. And it was it, like imminent that it was gonna pop like two or three meters uh, in front of us because there was so many branches in front of us. So in my head, it was a buffalo. So I was expecting to see something even my height or higher. And afterwards, when I talked to them in their heads, it was a lion. Why? Don't even ask. It was microseconds. And fortunately, it wasn't either, neither of those. It was a warthog. It was a <laughs> warthog, very angry, very fast. It was flying. It was already flying through the air. So, you know, this moment with too much adrenaline that you have it in slow motion. So this thing yeah. was already flying as a torpedo towards us. Two of us jumped to one side. But the other one, Nikki, who was behind me, he jumped to the other side just because he, we just jumped. Mm. And him and the warthog were about to collide in the air. And the warthog left actually some mud in his leg. We thought he was going to grab him. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a big animal. It was flying. Uh, I just remember our uniform shaking like this. And we were like <gasps> <laughs> trying to catch our breath again. We were, no, that night, well, that night and other nights, I've been saying like, this is it. This is it. No, I'm going to get yeah. killed one day. And then the next morning, you're like, where's my pangolins? Checking the pings. Yes. And you just, it's it's just incredibly exciting and 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 i keep saying how privileged we are of having the opportunity mm -hmm. to work with a species that it's so unknown so everything is so intriguing and everything you you want to know you need to know and and i think we we all can't stop <laughs> yeah well, that's absolutely amazing story and absolute passion demonstrated there again thank you so much <laughs> leno for the amazing work you're doing you're thank welcome you. les thank you and that brings us to the to the last member of the team that we're going to chat to today, and that's Charlie DeFoss. Charlie, welcome. Thank you, Liz. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. So Charlie's been intimately connected with a pangolin reintroduction project at Pinda since the outset in June 2019, when her responsibilities were extended to leading the project. Uh, Charlie holds a BSc honors degree in biodiversity and ecology and a master's in conservation ecology. In 2018, she joined the Pinda conservation team as one of our ecological monitors and has been with us ever since. So Charlie's passion for conservation in general, but pangolins in particular, is both inspirational and contagious. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, Charlie. Oh, thank you for having me today. We'll start off with what happens after the pangolins released. We've heard insights into it from, from Leno's <laughs> perspective, and now we'd like to get your perspective. <laughs> Yeah, so upon release, um, every single pangolin is fitted with two different tags to the non-vascular region of their scales. So that's the area where they have no nerve endings. Um, as unlike your other animals, a harness or a collar wouldn't suit because it will just slide off their head. So you'll see that the one in tag has quite a long antenna attached to it. And that's what we call our VHF tag, our very high frequency tag. And that's what we use to find them out in the field using our telemetry equipment, as Lena was explaining a little bit with her hairy night with the warthog. And then the other tag attached to it is our satellite tag. And with that, we collect the very fine scale data um, how are they moving? What time are they emerging out of their burrows or their rocky crevices? Um, yeah, what areas are they establishing? Are they actually establishing? And this is all groundbreaking stuff going on. But apart from the tags, um, initially, every pangolin needs to be weighed quite regularly. So upon release, the first weeks, we'll weigh it every day um, to make sure that there's no drop in the weight. I know Rick, Nikki and Ray spoke a little bit into it, but it's crucial for us to see that these animals are not losing condition. Um, it is a new environment. 
we don't know how they're going to settle here. We don't know where they came from originally. And even though we do the soft release process, um, it's vital for us to monitor. Because they've been kept in these horrible conditions that Nikki was showing um, by the poachers and the traders, they sometimes suppress diseases. And on extremely cold nights, for instance, or maybe they've had a stressful event running into a lion, we don't know what um, it causes it, but sometimes these suppressed diseases then suddenly become expressed. So that's why it's so vital to weigh them constantly the first couple of weeks. As we see that they are settling, of course, we want to take a more hands-off approach, let these animals be as free and as wild as possible, have as little human interaction. Um, we'll start weighing them less. So once every week until it only correlates to their tag changes, which should only be taking place about once every three months. Um, but it is absolutely vital that we keep doing it. Our first individual male, we actually noticed about three to four months after his release um, that he developed pneumonia. And if we didn't do this constant monitoring and weighing and checking up how they're walking, one of the other indications is if they're walking with their tail lifted high, um, only on their two hind legs, because the Temenix ground pangolin is bipedal. It's a sign of a very healthy pangolin. However, if its tail is dropped and it's dragging behind it, usually it's an indication of something is wrong, as well as usually a drop of about 10% of its body weight. And with that, we noticed with our first male about three, four months after his release, that something was wrong. And upon a close investigation, we actually realized that he had developed pneumonia, um, which we think he picked up while he was in the trade and it just stayed suppressed. And it correlated with change into cooler weather at that stage. Um, so that's why it's vital to do this long-term monitoring. And also for us to see, is this project really a success? Um, as Ray was saying, like you can't just release a pangolin and say, great, um, they're surviving. We've now given them a second chance at a wildlife, but how are we actually measuring it? Like, is the project really a success? And also for us to gain more knowledge on these species that is so unknown, like so little is known. We keep asking questions and like, I always laugh, people say, but you guys are the experts out there. I'm like, no, we're not experts. Like, how can you be an expert if you still every day have questions on a species and nobody can give you an answer? You can't just go and Google it or find a scientific paper on it. So that's why this post-release monitoring is so vital to make sure what we are doing um, is actually giving these animals a second chance at a wildlife and hopefully so that we can set out the right protocols for other reserves that would like to follow suit to follow as well. That's remarkable. So, so your soft release protocol is duplicable at other reserves and the lessons you've learned um, and that Nikki's learns at the animal hospital initially when she first engages with these characters, that's carried all the way through to the release site. And all that information is handed over to you guys to, to duplicate or, or, or implement. Yes, that's true. So um, the African Pangolin Working Group, of course, has advised us a lot as they have released them elsewhere. Um, but this is the first time for KwaZulu Natal. So it has been vital to share all this information. Brilliant. That's absolutely amazing. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Leno because you're out there in Big Five Reserve and you're a lady operating in amongst these big animals. <laughs> What's been your most unforgettable pangolin tracking moment? So there's been a couple. Um, <laughs> yeah. Too many to mention. Um, I think we've all had our hairy encounters. But the one that definitely stands out for me in terms of hairy experiences, um, it was luckily not at d night time. I don't know how I would have handled that. Um, but it was sort of late afternoon. We were tracking to find one of the big males in Pinda, and we were had to do his tag change. And as we kept getting closer, we were walking into extremely thick bush willows. I, I must say I'm quite short myself for those that have met me or seen me. Um, everybody else in my team is exceptionally taller than what I am. So I can't see through these bush willows. I'm actually crawling underneath them. And it was an extre extremely windy day. But just before we located the pangolin, we actually heard something really large run away from us in the field. And it was myself and our ecologist here on the reserve walking. And... Um, at that stage, we knew we had to find this pangolin, like its tags were going to die quite shortly if we didn't. So, And the signal was so close, so we decided, okay, let's just take a couple of steps forward, and we found the pangolin, but 
completely covered in some slobber of some animal and very fresh urine around it. And while we were still debating on what's the best protocols to take, um, I heard something approach us and I actually said to our ecologist, like, I'm short, I can't see. <laughs> um, please just like have a look in that direction. I'm hearing something approaching. Um, try and see over the bush willows. And he looked up and he told me, no, Charlie, there's actually five lions staring at us. Um, and as we located the pangolin as well, one of the tags were already ripped off by these lines that have clearly been trying to play with it. Not at all harmed the animal, no scratch marks on it, no indication of it. Um, but luckily we were able to change his tags and also get him up or get ourselves out of that area. Um, but that's definitely been my most hairiest encounter to date. Oh, that's absolutely remarkable. What a, what a pleasure and a privilege to be working in these big five reserves and be able to generate these experiences your children aren't going to believe you when you tell them what's happened to you. It's quite remarkable, Charlie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your commitment. I think that's been remarkable. I've really enjoyed the interactions with all of you so far. So I think I'd like to close up with a, with a round robin question for all of the panelists, if that's okay. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Charlie, seeing as that you've got the mic at the moment. So what do you think has been the biggest win for this project so far for you? So for me personally, the biggest wins have been that we actually are um, starting to tick off our four measures of success. So the first one for us is to see that we are giving these animals a second chance at the wildlife and that they are currently surviving for more than one year post release. But apart from that, it's also seeing that they are establishing territories and home ranges, but then really the cherry on the cake. Um, as a couple of people might know by now, as if we've had the first pangolin pup born on Pinda in what we know as more than 40 years of absence from Pinda alone. Um, and it's been such a remarkable experience. And I think very few people saw me after I actually got to see it the first time, just purely by chance. And I was actually in tears, tears of joy. Um, so that's been a real cherry on the cake and just showing that we are putting a viable population back into this region. Oh, that's quite remarkable, Nikki. And I think for me, that was probably my seminal moment at Pinda as well, was when the first cheetah that was conceived on Pinda was born and we saw those first cubs. And now we're getting it with another species 30 years later, pioneering reintroductions again of the same species. Just a remarkable story. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie. Really appreciate that. Um, Lena, what have been the big wins for you in this project so far? Wow, there's been so many. To be honest, every single thing we've achieved has been a big, a big win. Of course, it's it's been a um, it's been a bittersweet also uh, journey because because it's very sad when you put so much effort and time into a particular animal in the field and then you ended up losing it for some reason. There's so many possibilities why that animal cannot make it. But every animal that we've reintroduced and still alive after all the process that each one of us have told you that being poached, being rescued, being rehabilitated, being soft release, being released, being monitored, every single animal, it's, it's a big success. To me, the biggest, biggest ever, it's going to be when two of the released pangolins in the area mate and conceive a baby in 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 the area that would be just i think clearly when we when we understood that reintroduced animals are going to start breeding that would be amazing fantastic thank you so much leno nikki i'd go across to you what in your opinion has been the biggest win in the project so far well i mean i echo everybody's uh, sentiments um just working with these animals and learning about them every single day is 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 amazing because there's something to learn about them every single day. Um, it, it might sound corny, but it really is true. Um, I think one of the wins. I mean, there are a couple. There's I can't just single it down to one. But yeah. um, one of the wins is working with all these amazing organisations. Uh, it's it's just such a privilege, as you say, that collaboration. Um, amongst all the organizations um, has been quite incredible um, and so uplifting to see everybody so committed and dedicated to this incredible animal trying to keep it on the planet. You know, it's been here for 84 million years um, and, and that's what we're essentially all trying to do is, is, is trying to keep them on the planet. Um, so that's, that's incredible. Um, and I think for me... Uh, apart from, from that, I, I think I have to say putting pangolins back into KwaZulu-Natal 
has been from a conservation perspective um, it's just quite a remarkable process. It really has been. It's it's just flowed and it's fitted and it's been um, it's been wonderful. So th those have been highlights. That's remarkable. I, I concur. I mean, seeing them in Zululand uh, is is really quite remarkable. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, you. Ray, would you like to tell us from your perspective what what's been the the, the highlight? R Ray, sorry, I think you might be muted. Yeah, sorry, Les, me and technology. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't like to look at it as a project because a project um, has got a beginning and an end. I kind of like to look at it as we're all on a bit of a mission. You know, we um, the, the teams on the ground are unbelievable. They're formidable. I've, I've never experienced such dedication out of any bunch of conservationists in my life. And, you know, uh, the greatest reward for a conservation biologist is to reintroduce a previously ecologically extinct species into its natural distribution. And if you have a look at the how young this project is and what everybody's achieved, it is truly mind-blowing. Um, and, and this purely comes from um, dedicated conservationists on the ground and, and those at uh, uh, the field staff at Magnoni and Punda and, and Lino. We hope to have her back soon. She's visiting family in Mexico, so we'll drag her back kicking and screaming if we have to. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's been a remarkable experience, and I never thought I would experience such a, um, a, a conservation highlight that I'm involved in. And uh, yeah, just to thank everybody on the ground and everybody from the hospital and from the security forces, um, everybody plays a hand in, in this chain of cards that leads up to this wonderful success. I've just received a video um, link from one of the field staff at Pinda um, where that female walked straight past the um, the ranger with a baby on its back and just ignored the guy like a stop street. <laughs> Brilliant. That's amazing, Ray. Uh, thank you so much. And I think the, for me, it's it's a panel like you who are all passionate about what you do. And this is reflected clearly in the way you guys have uh, shared your experiences with us today. Um, so I just want to go through some of the questions that were raised last week that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, and, and, and the important one was relating to why are we telling um, people on social media where we're taking the pangolins? Um, and, and I think, Ray, maybe you can, you can talk to us about how people find these pangolins in the field, if you don't mind. Yes, sure. So um, if, if, you, if you're posting pictures on social media about rhino, you can pretty much find them if you go and look um, hard enough. Um, I, I had a reporter with me the one day, and I said, there's a pangolin three meters from you, and she couldn't find it. These things are ghosts. they um, solitary, nocturnal, and territorial. So some of the guys we've caught, we caught the one chap at a, at a, um, a, a mall, uh, and we pulled the pangolin out of his backpack as well as his cell phone, and you get almost an indigenous species of dog in Africa, a, a, a domesticated dog called Africanus. And he had a, a four or five of these trained on pangolin scent. So that's one way that they've worked out how to actually try and find them. The, the other way is um, in, in the African savannas, most certainly in, in, in the bushveld regions of Africa, um, you get what we term these young herd boys who look after the cattle and the goats for even 12, 13 hours a day. They spend with their livestock to protect them, to watch over them, because livestock is often a form of wealth for these people. So these chaps spend the greater part of the daylight out in the bush. Now, pangolins are territorial, and in winter they come out and bake, bake in the sun for a bit, and they are visible, and they have their favorite burrows. And these young chaps know exactly where they are. You offer him a hundred US dollars, I promise you, you'll have a pangolin on your lap in three, four hours. To us, um, we, some of us have never seen a pangolin in the bush and we've been in the bush all our adult lives. Um, hmm. but, but when you're spending every single day for years in, in, in the bush, you kind of get a, an idea where they are. And once that monetary reward is handed out through what we term the bush telegraph in these villages, they will source you one pretty quickly. But if a person had to just go onto Manioni or go onto Pinda or go into the Kruger to look for a pangolin, 
you better take a hell of a lot of food and a hell of a lot of stuff because you're going to be out there years looking. It's an opportunistic, random chance event. The only place I know of where you can actively try and track a pangolin down is in the soft red Kalahari sands of the Kalahari Namba desert area. Otherwise, it's, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible. Thanks very much, Ray. And I think that also goes to the question about why we're exposing this on social media and, and raising um, the profile of the African Pangolin Working Group and the Johannesburg Veterinary Hospital. We need support and we need funding for these organizations. So the question, when I posed it to Simon Naylor, the warden at, at uh, Pinder Private Game Reserve, um, the risk of exposing uh, this kind of activity on social media to the very pangolins that we're trying to save, what's that risk? And his response was actually really interesting because he said, because of what you've just described, that pangolins are incredibly difficult to find. Poachers don't get the information of social media. They get the information from local people and from local staff members. But, but you're not going to increase the exposure to staff members and the normal channels that poachers use because social media isn't a vehicle that they normally um, use. That's the first thing. The second thing, and, and probably most important thing, is that we need the funding to have the researchers that are tracking these animals and we need the funding to secure the reserves that are protecting these animals and if you add those two things the risk to the poachers dramatically increases and when you add to that how difficult it is to find them and the period of time that a poacher is going to need in a protected reserve going where the researchers are going to look for these animals the chances of the poacher getting caught are very big so, so the benefits of raising the funding through the research and the African Pangolin Working Group and funding the security in the reserve far outweigh the specific risk to the specific animals uh, in the field because these currently aren't areas where pangolins have existed before, so they're not currently targets, and these aren't currently the areas that the trafficking is happening out of. So there's, there's no risk from that perspective. So I hope that answers uh, the questions from, from the last from the last uh, session that we had. We'd like to go into the question and answer session now. Um, and I think we'll go with the first question here was, um, was for you, Ray. Um, and I can just get my mouse into the right place. So the, the question was from Mone Rath. Um, Ray, aren't you concerned for exposing your participation in these sting operations? Won't this video put you in the operation in jeopardy? Um, to a certain extent, that, that is a risk, but I think you've answered it, Les, in your previous um, statement that uh, uh, these guys don't follow classic social media channels uh, as, as much as we've seen in, in, in Rhino and that, but um, it's more Bush Telegraph, African Telegraph, speak to one another. Um, I do run the risk. Uh, of exposing myself but if you google me I'm all over the internet like a bad rash but I'm still managing to catch them <laughs> <laughs> so my, my wife says I think it's time you laid your your cowboy hat down um, I, I haven't had the uh, <clears throat> the effect or the feeling that I've I've been made yet but but it, it, it is a, a, a possibility yes um, I if I had to make a personal choice, I would, I would rather have some of the security forces take over the intelligence I do. Uh, we've tried that before and they've failed. Um, so Nikki said to me the other day, you can't leave this. Who else is going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> we need some succession planning there, Ray, if we're going to make this sustainable. I know. <laughs> yes, correct. I'm a, I'm cool. a scientist. I shouldn't be gun-ho, you know. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. And there's a second question from Fone, from Monet, which I'll also direct to you, Ray, if you don't mind. What percentage of the pangolins saved in these operations actually survive post-capture? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in the early days, and and um, Nikki and Dr. Karin from the hospital will agree with me, um, it, it was reasonably low because th these animals have got an incredibly unique physiology um, their metabolism is off the charts they they react more uh, sometimes like reptiles than they do like mammals um, but but the hospital and the staff and Nikki and dr. Karin uh, have had an exponential learning curve about pangolin biology and pangolin anatomy and physiology 
And I can say with the greatest confidence, there's not another hospital like that in the world. And the, the, um, the success has ranged from about five, six years ago to 50% to over 80% now. Um, obviously, it depends on what condition they come out of the trade. If they've been held in the trade for more than two weeks, the chances are reasonable that they'll make it, but, but not that good. They're just too far gone. Um, so when you open that box or, or, or at the hospital, you anesthetize and you open that pangolin up, only then do you see what level of condition it in. And, and sometimes it's, it brings you to tears because that animal is just waning away. Um, hmm. But I would say um, over the last year or two, up to 80%. That is absolutely remarkable. Thanks, Ray. And I think question three from Gary Curtis for Nikki. The seizure of pangolin scales we see as recently as January in Nigeria, heading to Vietnam, clearly large scale operations and surely are internationally financed. How can these crime rings be broken? I'm a wildlife rehabilitation specialist. I'm not a, a crime expert or syndicate expert. Um, yeah. But I mean, just I would imagine that you would have to have, um, you know, collaboration between all the countries involved um, in Africa and in Asia. You'd have to have uh, work with people that aren't corrupt, governments that aren't corrupt, and, and um, somehow, if you get to that point, you'll be able to start clamping down on the syndicates. Ray, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. I, I, I think what you said is very pertinent. What hasn't been done, Les, is to infiltrate these syndicates. And we very, very urgently need to do this. So we need to go into these African countries. Um, uh, we've developed a very good working relationship with Nigeria. So we will be, we were in Nigeria in February. We'll be going back into Nigeria. Um, and we need to infiltrate these syndicates from the guys right on the ground, from the bushmeat operators, and then go into the and, and, and meet up with the middlemen. And we need to find how and why and what's driving them and, and what financial resources. At the, at the moment, that's an enigma. I'm actually quite, quite uh, shocked that um, Interpol or, or some agencies haven't already initiated this, but it's, it's, it's critical that we need to find the mechanisms on, on, how the, on how these pangolin scales are accumulated. We know, for example, in the Gulf of Guinea, that they are sourced in countries such as Ghana, Cameroon, uh, Cote d'Ivory, uh, all those areas, uh, Central African Republic, the DRC, and then brought into Nigeria, into Lagos, and sent out as a massive shipment. So it's not each country that's responsible. It's, it's, it's a huge collection operation that we need to infiltrate. Yeah, and I think the, <clears throat> as successful as an operation like this is with collaboration, the key to conservation success is going to be collaboration. And I think you've both alluded to that. The key yeah. to effective uh, policing and shutting down international um, syndicates is going to be cooperation. It's going to have to be a coordinated cooperation across many jurisdictions and many different countries. So that, that's definitely going to have to be part of the future. Correct. So I think um, uh, a question from uh, Barbara Wood for Charlie. After the release, what is the chance of them breeding, Charlie? So it's part of what we're trying to measure here at Panda. Um, so far, so little is known about pangolin breeding. Um, but from the little research out there, it seems to be that the females, they only have a pup about once every two years. So our goal is to try and monitor them for at least two years post-release. Um, and from the data that we've collected so far, we do see that three of our females are currently being trailed by different males. And there is some overlap in their ranges, even though they are extremely territorial, even the males towards the females. And there's a specifically one female male that's been what we think now courting for about the last six months. So we are seriously hoping that there has been a, reprodu a successful reproduction event there. But it is part of what we're trying to figure out through this project as so little is known about these species. And as I keep saying, we keep having this, all these new questions popping up as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's remarkable work that you guys have done. And I think that's 
the answers are going to come. We just need a bit of time. It's like all the, all the information that we have on all the other species took time. 30 years ago, we didn't know anything about many of the species that we now have um, really an open encyclopedia on and we can Google information. That'll come with pangolins, but we just need time. So it's because of this work that you guys are doing now that we're building that. So the next question, I think, from um, Petro Diamant for, for Nikki. Many people feel helpless through the trade, and apart from advocating support and funding organizations who work with pangolins, what more can a general person do to contribute to the safety of pangolin? Hi, Petro. Um, I think I think the, the, the average person um, can can talk about pangolins, can uh, raise awareness in all their communities and circles about pangolins um, at their schools um, and universities and, and communities, as I say. And I think, as you say, the advocating, supporting and funding organizations that do do the work with uh, the legitimate work with pangolins is very, very important because without that support, we can't do that work. Um, so I think that is critical to have um, for all of our organisations to have a good support base uh, from from which we can carry on our work. Absolutely, and it, it is that funding that that facilitates the ability to make a difference. Um, and and Lena, obviously, uh, the African Pangolin Working Group is exclusively funded by donors. How do donors make a contribution directly to the African Pangolin Working Group? Well, they can go straight to the website, to our website, and in every one of our social media, there's always a link on where and how can they donate. I, I just want to, to, if it's possible, to mention to everyone who's hearing us that it doesn't matter how much your donation is. A lot of people feel like, oh, I can only donate 10 rand or 15 rand, and they feel kind of silly or ridiculous about it. And in every single donation as, is as, as important as each other, because all together, they make a big, big difference. So please don't be shy. We, we appreciate every single effort and every small donation. Believe me, it makes a big difference, even if it's a tiny one. So everyone can help us anyhow in any way. And as Nikki said, just talk about them. Uh, talk about pangolins. If you hear there's someone selling scales, report it. Uh, make it public. Yeah, let's make noise about it. That's how everyone can help us. Fantastic, Lena. Thanks very much. And and the last question from Virginia Woolf, again for Ray. Surely pressure should be put on the World Health Organization to remove TCM from the compendium to stop the illegal trade in wildlife body parts, such as pangolin scales, to increase TCM demand in China. Sorry, to, yeah. to increase TCM demand. My apologies. <laughs> the inflection was wrong there, Ray. Did you hear that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, that's a very difficult question on multiple levels. I'm, I'm going to start with the first level that um, it, most communities around the world are entrenched in their own cultures. Now, um, Asian and in particular Chinese culture goes back many, many thousands of years. I've got writings of um, coming out of the uh, 400 AD and 500 AD in, in the dynasties there in China where uh, pangolins were used firstly for spiritual remedies and secondly, after that, um, in more recent times, to cure medical ailments. Um, the, the large majority of uh, people in, I'm going to say Asia, not just China, um, Vietnam, Malaysia, China, all those areas, um, more than 90% uh, of those people do not utilize Western medicine as advocated by the World Health Organization. They use cultural medicine, and it's very similar in Africa. Um, the people in Africa, south of the Sahara, well over 70% uh, uh, visit traditional healers. So uh, the origin of modern medicine actually stems from cultural medicine, mostly from herbal remedies uh, from plants and trees, but um, about 25% from animal products. And these cultural belief systems are heavily in place still today. Uh, and we can't um, apply a Western medicine rules and Roman law to to eliminate traditional Chinese medicine or Asian medicine or cultural medicine for that matter. What we need to do is find uh, sustainable alternatives uh, that are culturally acceptable. Um, 
that is easier said than done, but, but to, to advocate it, the World Health Organization will never advocate it. They, they do um, advocate the use of cultural medicines to a certain extent and the harvesting, particularly of certain herbs and plants, um, but, but they, they won't um, promote that at all. We need to do it um, through the youth and through education policies, but to take away a person's culture is going to create a world war. Um, a religion is a culture. Um, Christianity is a culture. Being Muslim is a culture. So it's, it's very difficult. The problem with educating the youth is we don't have two decades. If we don't act within this very small window of opportunity we have now to re reverse the trade in pangolins, um, they'll be gone in two decades. So I, I don't have all the answers, but... Um, just banning stuff, is, it won't work either, unfortunately. Thanks, Ray. And I think, unfortunately, we are dealing in a, in a global village and the world has become a global village and there's many more players that can start having influences in this global village. But today's events for me have been an unbelievable light in this darkness of what's happening around us in, in the conservation world. All wildlife is under threat. The biggest threat is space for wildlife, which is being reduced. And he has a wonderful story um, of a success story with a very, very endangered species. So we hope that this behind the scenes peek at the Pangolin Reintroduction Project has shed some light on their incredible effort and expertise and the process from rescue, from traffickers to the rehabilitation and to the release in the wild again. It's projects like this that give us hope for pangolin survival. It truly is a privilege to work with such an esteemed, energetic, passionate group of partners in the African Pangolin Working Group and the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. You really are making a difference to these creatures every single day. And as is our practice when we wrap up these uh, events, we normally end with a quotation. And the quotation that's been chosen for us for today is, you such a small group of people making such a big difference. I'd like to share with you Margaret Mead's words and she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.